All right, everyone, uh, welcome to my second part of my Laurier Years uh, uh, series. Uh, this one uh, deals with the same time frame as the first one, 1896 and 1911, because those are the, uh, the years, the 15-year period uh, with which uh, Wilfrid Laurier would govern Canada. Uh, and um, for our purposes here, I think what I really want to talk about now is sort of the immigrant experience. And uh, so we're going to cover a lot of territory. Um, and really, really very interesting because oftentimes when we look at or talk about uh, new immigrants coming to Canada, you know, we just sort of have this vague sense of them coming over, tilling the land, building a home, having families, living happily ever after. Um, well, it wasn't quite that easy. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to talk about the challenges that they faced. But, um, you know, why was Canada so fixated on the idea of... Um, bringing in immigrants. Essentially, the primary motive of bringing in immigrants was the fact that we had a tremendous he uh, amount of land in between the Canadian Rockies and uh, the uh, eastern part of um, Manitoba, let's call it, what is now Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, um, and Manitoba as well, uh, that has got tremendous agricultural potential. And in order to establish a strong presence, to make the prairies productive, we needed to bring in people because Canada simply did not have the population of people to uh, sort of uh, fill out this great expanse known as the prairie provinces of Canada. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, before we begin, let's start here. You know, there's a typical picture of the landscape. If you've ever driven over the prairies or if you've ever driven over the American Midwest or flown over it, you know, it looks like a checkerboard. I remember that's one thing I remember flying over um, uh, Saskatchewan and thinking that looked like a checkerboard uh, with all the different color squares and so forth. Um, it is just this incredibly beautiful but, you know, daunting flat along the landscape. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a typical scene of, of, of you know, a, a prairie uh, farm. Uh, and this is the kind of poster that would be seen by Europeans when these things would be sent over in a, in a way to entice people to come to Canada, you know. And uh, there are going to be a lot of reasons why people would decide to come. We'll talk about those push and pull factors as we... Um, as we move forward. We labeled ourselves as the last best West, right? Because the Americans had just recently closed off homesteading. They felt that their prairies had been satiated by an appropriate amount of people. Now it was time to close the door temporarily and begin to develop their Midwest. Well, now Canada is saying, hey, you know what? We're opening up here. We are the last best West. So. The thinking behind this was that more money and more people became the hallmarks of the Laurier era. The growing economy attracted immigrants, who in turn stimulated growth, which then encouraged more immigration. So in other words, economic growth encourages greater growth. You bring in more people, you, you, there's more harvest. There's more sales, there's more demand. And, and the cycle continues. So. Um, as long as we're producing things that not only feed the Canadian population but can be sold overseas on the open market, the more wealth that is coming into the country. Between 1896 and 1914, Canada swelled with immigrants, especially because the U.S. ended free homestead lands, and that's once again why we use the term the last best West. Uh, Minister of the Interior at the time under the Laurier administration was Clifford Sifton, had an open-door policy and the prairies became far more diverse than Eastern Canada, despite objections from those who feared the dramatic difference in language and culture. I mean, you know, it was already complicated navigating your way through having, you know, French as a, as a predominant language, having English as a predominant language, and then having literally hundreds of, of Aboriginal languages and dialects as well. Well now, on top of that, you are asking people from Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Russia, Germany, Britain and France and other parts of, 
of Central and Southern uh, and Eastern Europe to come to Canada. And people were saying, well, this is all fine and good, but what the heck's going to happen when you put them all together? Uh, then no one's going to understand each other. You know, well, the hope is that, you know, as they develop roots in the country and as they have children, that those children will learn to speak English and, and come a couple generations, they'll be bilingual because they'll be speaking their mother tongue and they'll also be speaking English and French as well. That, that was sort of the thinking and the hope at the time. Ukrainians, Poles, Czechs, Russians, Hungarians, Romanians, Austrians, and many others settled across the prairies. Over 30% though were British, but most failed at farming because they were largely working class city dwellers. Here's the thing with farming. You're living in Europe somewhere and you see this poster and you say, oh, wow, free land. Free land, all I gotta do is get there and till it and, and it's all mine. Well, anybody and any of you any of you watching this that have a history or a background or you've been connected with an agricultural life will know that it is far more complex. There are so many variables. There is a tremendous amount of preliminary knowledge that is required to be a successful farmer. So a lot of the British that came um, were keen certainly to be farmers, but they had no experience doing it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, most of them failed because they were largely uh, city dwellers. And what ends up happening to them is they end up moving into the bigger cities of Canada, whether it be Vancouver or most notably Toronto and Montreal, where they end up doing the kind of work in those cities that they were doing in, you know, Liverpool and Manchester and Birmingham that they fled from, you know, because of the industrial squalor with which they lived. Now they ended up, you know, I guess on one level, uh, the air was cleaner in Canada. There was more access to clean water and more space. But if you're working in a factory in Montreal or working in a factory in Liverpool, ultimately you're still working in a factory, so. All right. American settlers. So American settlers from the Southern Plains had greater success than Europeans. They were welcomed. They had experience with prairie farming. They brought far more money and equipment with them than their counterparts, where they brought $1,000 compared to $15 from the average European family. I mean, the, the, the advantage of the Americans was that they were English speakers. Uh, so, um, and you know, Canada was at that point predominantly English speaking. Um, they were the ones that brought up this farm equipment, by the way, that, you know, when they came up with their farm equipment, you know, your neighbor would say, oh, hey, pleased to meet you, welcome to Canada. By the way, where'd you get that? What is that? Where'd you buy that thing? That's an incredible piece of machinery there. Oh yeah, I got it in Bismarck, North Dakota, or whatever it may be, or, or you know, wherever else they came from. So, um, plus they came with a lot more money. So it's interesting that a lot of these Americans that came up um, really kind of set the tone for how to um, be successful because a lot of them were coming from the Midwest, Wyoming, Kansas, Missouri, places like that, where the agriculture and the, and the climate was quite similar to that of the Canadian prairies as well. American settlers favored Alberta, which had become overwhelmingly American, and between 1896, over one million Americans migrated to Canada, you know. So Alberta, you know, and one of my students recently said to me, oh, the Calgary Stampede, is that why, like, they're all cowboys and lassoes and, which is a terrible stereotype, but, you know, at the same time, that association with cowboys in Calgary, uh, you know, it, it is, is rooted in, all those Americans that came up from the Midwest, you know, their descendants, a million of them came up to Alberta during this time. So, Additionally, many British orphaned children came to Canada, but while many were keen to adopt them, some saw them simply as cheap labor, so experiences for them varied and at times they were exploited horribly. What a tragedy. There were so many orphaned children because what you had in, the, in Britain at the time were hundreds of thousands of people packed into cities, you know, working in factories, living in squalor, in filth, in terrible conditions, uh, many of whom maybe were not in a position to raise a child, and many kids are put up for adoption. And what happens is that 
pioneer families on the Canadian prairies see that there's an opportunity to adopt these orphan children. Now many of these families are thinking, great, let's, let's adopt a child that's more hands on deck, more people tilling the field, right? Where others might say, hey, let's adopt a child because we can't have children for whatever reason and we want to have children that we can love and nurture and raise in Canada. So, you know, take a pick which ones had a better time in Canada. The ones that came who were looked at simply as a resource, I mean, it was probably already terrible for these poor kids to leave their parents, but to actually leave the country and end up in the middle of Canada would have been terrifying. And what they needed most was a, a, a family that provided warmth and love and, 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 and all those things that children need in order to be growing up in a wholesome, loving environment. Uh, but that wasn't the case always. And there were many, many stories much later of these kids when they grew up who talked about um, their dreadful experiences. And of course, as soon as they were old enough to leave home, they would. But, you know, it can be very, very scarring to find yourself in a situation where you're in a household where you're being treated as a, as a, as a resource, you know, more than a, a, a son or daughter, so to speak. So. All right, so let's look at the motives, I mean, other than the obvious, why people are coming. Um, between 1891 and 1921, 30-year period, Canada's population doubled with over 60% settling in the West. Migration happened for two reasons. Number one, some fled persecution, okay, so they were in trouble or there was a war or they were being discriminated against because of their religion or what have you. There were land shortages, okay, because Europe is a relatively small geographical area. Just look at a map. Look at a map of Europe and look at a map of Canada. You know, I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think of all those people living in Europe in such a small geographical area. And of course, it had gotten to a point where all the best land had been taken up. There, there are hundreds of thousands of open fields in the middle of, of Europe waiting for people to take. There wasn't any of that. That was in Canada, right? So um, those would be called push factors. The reasons people leave, right? Persecution, land shortage. Others were enticed by opportunity, which are known as pull factors, the things that brought them to Canada. Um, free land would have been a pull factor. Beautiful climate, um, uh, escaping hardship, that's a pull factor. Push is what pushes you out of the country, pull is what brings you in. Okay, Both push and pull often work together. Most sought a better life than the one they left, makes sense. Uh, like thousands of Ukrainians who arrived in Edmonton by 1891, fleeing chronic uh, crop failures in the Ukraine, starvation, and overpopulation. Now what's interesting is uh, the Ukrainians were probably, I'd say, across the board, the most successful farmers on the Canadian prairies. Why? Because they had tremendous experience in agriculture, and B, they were coming from a climate that was almost identical to the Canadian prairies. So they understood the Canadian winter. They understood the Canadian summer. If you're coming from Great Britain or northern France and you experience a prairie winter for the first time, it's unlike anything you've ever experienced. So, you know, that sort of being climatized, having to adjust to the incredible uh, change in, 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 in uh, climate would be a tough one. Think of people that are coming from Italy, you know, southern Italy, the, the, or the Mediterranean area. They would have been in for a major shock in terms of what they had to face. Russian Dukobors fled mandatory military service because it was against their religious beliefs. Canada exempted them from military service, gave them free land, and paid for their passage. Why on earth would they not come? Hey, you know what? You got to do mandatory military service under the Tsar's government? You won't have to do it with us. You come to Canada, we give you free land. And if you come to Canada, we'll pay for you to get here. Well, you know, why wouldn't you go? And you know, you have to consider that when these people got here, they felt tremendously blessed to have this opportunity. They were going to work darn hard to make this work. And like I say, the Russians, the Ukrainians did quite well because they were coming from a climate that was quite similar. So, 
All right, now let's look at the experience of um, what it was like and what it meant to actually be successful in the Canadian Prairie. So the first task of a new settler was to raise at least $500 to outfit their homestead with the basics. You need a plow, you need a wagon, you need horses, and you need a milk cow. Okay, 500 bucks just to get going. Now here's the thing. You've just traveled across the Atlantic, and you've traveled up the St. Lawrence into Quebec, you've taken trains, and you've suddenly been escorted to your land, and the uh, immigration agent takes you and says, well, there you go. There's your land. And you look at it, you go, well, where, where's, where's, the, where's my home? Oh, you've got to build your own home. And... It's April now, so I would get cracking pretty quick because when the fall winds come and the rains and then the winter freeze, you want to make sure you've got a home. Well, and then you've got all this land, right? And, and holy mackerel, but, but building shelter is probably the very, very, very first thing you want to do, and then you want to raise the money. So the Americans that came up with $1,000 in their pocket, plus bringing machinery with them, they were already in a very good position. But if you were coming from the Ukraine and you had $15 in your pocket, you had to basically put yourself in service of others. So maybe you might volunteer, or no, not volunteer, you need to get paid, but you might offer to work on somebody else's farm, you might work in a local store, you might work in a mine, whatever it is. You do whatever work you need to do to get your 500 bucks so that you can get the bare essentials to get started. But first and foremost is to build a home. And if you don't have any money and you don't have access to any resources or any timber, you got to work with the elements. And what ends up happening is they end up building homes out of mud, uh, or sod rather, uh, you know, grass and dirt homes. To raise this, they often worked for others in lumber mills, railway work, or mining camps. The first house was often mud-covered sod on a wood frame and usually had open windows covered with sacks and a thatched roof. This is like something out of medieval Europe. But you know what? It's better than nothing, right? And, and while it wasn't ideal, like because in the winter it leaked, <coughs> in the summer it was dry and there were flies everywhere and it smelled bad, I mean, you know, you've got to do what you got to do. Saudis often were fly and flea infested in summers and usually smelled bad and oftentimes they leaked. So that was their nickname, Saudis. Uh, other hardships included the winters, the harsh winters, monotonous diet. There wasn't a lot of diversity yet. Uh, the landscape could be very, very, it is now the prairies are beautiful, but it can be overwhelming how it's just flat. You know, here in British Columbia, where I'm doing these lectures from, we have lots of trees, we have lots of mountains, we have lots of forests and oceans, and we have an incredibly diverse landscape here, but on the prairies, it's pretty well flat. You have natural disasters on the prairies, hail, drought is terrifying because you need rain to feed your crops, and you have locusts or grasshoppers, right, um, which can be a real problem as well. The first two years were the hardest, and more settlers would bring greater infrastructure with like roads and bridges and better access to towns and markets. So, if you were the first one in your neighborhood, if we can call it a neighborhood, in your landscape, you had no one there to help you. You basically were on your own, and you just simply had to survive. The more people that came in, you know, if you were new and, and, and someone had set up a homestead, chances are pretty good they're going to come over and say, Hey, my name's Fred. I'm your neighbor. Nice to meet you. Listen, I just want to give you a heads up. This is not going to be easy. Uh, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. And this is what you need to prioritize, ABC. The more people that come in, the more important it is that these farms are connected through roads. So when I say infrastructure, I mean things like roads and hospitals and schools and all those things that connect people. 
that you know. But but initially, when you're just a scattering of, of farms throughout a vast landscape, you didn't have the benefits of these uh, these things like bridges and roads and access to towns and markets. So, you know, the more people that came, the better the infrastructure, the more access there was to to grocery and markets, and the easier it was. But uh, those initial waves really, boy oh boy, it was tough. Now, of course, not all the newcomers ended up on the prairies. Many ended up in the cities. Um, almost a third of them ended up uh, in Canada, ended up in the cities as the development of manufacturing industries created many new jobs. By 1914, 50% of Canada's population was urban, with Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Calgary growing rapidly. The, even today, of course, these are some of our major centers in the country. Most newcomers were unskilled and spoke little English and were often exploited in unsafe and low-paying factory jobs. The sad part of this is that these people that came uh, were absolutely helpless to, to, uh, to negotiate wages or working conditions. They had none of that. There was, the Canadian government had not implemented work standards of any kind. So these poor folks that came were really susceptible to being taken advantage of, and they were. And the thing is, you were quite disposable. If you complained about your job, you'd be fired, right? And you didn't want to be fired because oftentimes the place that you worked also provided you with the home in which you lived, which was never very nice. But still, so if you lose your job, you're kicked out of your home at the same time. So. They lived in ghettos with small rooms with no sunlight, fresh air, heat, leading to disease and poor health. I mean, you think about living in one single room with your brothers and sisters and mom and dad. Um, no ventilation, no circulation, no windows, no air conditioning, no heat. Um, you can imagine in the height of summer it would have been grotesquely stifling. In the winter it would be bitterly cold. Um, you know. And so many people were dying from diseases as related to the conditions in which they lived. Pay was about 10 to 15 dollars a week at 10 to 12 hours a day for six days a week in loud and dirty surroundings with no job security. 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week for just enough to pay your bills. That was your life. Your life was working. Because when you came home, you ate and went to bed and you got up and did it again. Right? Pretty horrible. Struggling families depended on churches for help, and the government did not think it was responsible for the poor. This was before you had unemployment insurance and workers' benefits and old age pensions and all those things. You know, the general consensus was that well, somebody's got to do the work, and uh, you know, that's just the way life is. You know, not everybody gets to live well and 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 eat well, and uh, you know. There was almost sort of an attitude that, you know, well, you work where you're supposed to. So if you're not well educated and you can't speak English, then uh, you're going to work in factories. You know, that's, uh, you know, and, and, and that was your place, you know. So there was really kind of a, a, a social class attitude, you know, and it was much more acute or stratified rather in, in Great Britain, but in Canada there was a sense that, you know, these people chose to come here and they don't have to work there, um, so you make your bed, you lie in it, so to speak. As the gap between rich and poor widened, workers sought a greater share of the wealth they produced. Okay, you can imagine after working 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, for 10 to 15 bucks a week, workers are going to begin to say, wait a second here, why am I breaking my neck every day for peanuts? Maybe, just maybe, if I got paid better and could actually live better and feed my family better and buy nicer clothes and not live in filth, um, I would feel good about my job, right? Yeah, and this is the thing that, that, that I think was really missing, in, was not only empathy, but the idea that if you pay people a little more, you're telling them that you value their labor, you value their work. That was not going to happen. Right? In, in those days, company owners were not in the least bit interested in alleviating the hardships in which these people lived. I don't want to say they were all 
ignorant and horrible people. That's not the case. But the point was is that there was nothing in place to protect these people. And once they began to realize that nothing was going to change on the, the factory owner's end, that they, the working people, were going to have to come up with a system to try to alleviate their own hardship by negotiating better pay. And that's where unions come from. A collection of workers who come together so they, they can go as a group to their boss and say, look, we the workers in this peanut factory uh, wish to, uh, you know, suggest that you reduce the days to eight hours a day and you slightly increase our pay, whatever it may be. Um, Most importantly is workers understanding, and before I move on, this is important too, workers understanding that what they produced in terms of profit far exceeded what they got paid. So for example, um, and Karl Marx uh, lined this out in, in his writings uh, of the 1850s and 60s. Uh, Karl Marx was the father of Marxism, which later becomes communism. This is what Marx said. He said, look, if you're working, you're getting paid a buck an hour, one dollar an hour, and this is just an example, and you're working at a burger factory, and every hour you're producing twenty dollars of profit, that's profit, not the expense of, what, of, the, of the bun and the meat and the cheese. That's on top of that. When those burgers go to market, that boss is making $20 an hour off your labor. You, the worker, are producing $20 a profit for one person upstairs in a leather chair with a Cuban cigar and a brandy. Once workers said, recognized that their surplus value, their labor, their hard work was bringing tremendous profits to one person, they were saying, look, why don't I get... 25% and you get, why, why don't you increase my wage? You're still going to make a huge profit off my labor, you know, but treat me with dignity and respect. And if you're not going to do it, I'm going to start talking to all the guys in the factory here and we're going to come talk to you as a group and say we would like to demand better wages, right? Now, this leads to all kinds of problems where people are getting fired or the business owner brings in like thugs to beat workers up. It gets really, really ugly, but the push towards union wouldn't have necessarily have needed to happen if business interests were more empathetic and more willing to be reasonable when it came to wage increases. So, from 1880 onwards, workers began to organize unions but it was an uphill battle. They could be fired and replaced if they went on strike, and the government generally favored the interests of business. Well, who the heck can you turn to? If the government is going to side with business every time you say you want a wage increase and then you get fired, I mean, the problem is you're in a factory with 50 people. You 50 go as a union to your boss and say, we'd like better wages. He fires all 50 of you. He hires 50 new people. The 50 new people that come into the factory know from the fact that they're replacing people that were fired that they're on a bit of a short leash. So if you're that disposable and that unprotected, um, that is creating conditions where workers are going to have to find a way of getting a better share of what they feel they had earned. So, and when the government's going to back the, the factory owner, the business owner, all you've got are yourselves, and that's where unions come from. Company, companies hired private police or militia to break up strikes. Perfect example right here on Vancouver Island. The Dunsmere coal mines on Vancouver Island saw the most bitter strikes of workers between 1912 and 14. Workers toiled for low wages and often were maimed or died in explosions. You know, of all the work that was involved in building this country, whether it be fishing or lumber or railway building, mining is something completely unique. You are underground, you are in chronic darkness, you are breathing in and ingesting horrible dust that is impacting your, your health, uh, you are susceptible to explosions because you're dealing with dynamite all the time. I mean, mine work was horrible work. So they're basically saying, look, you know, we are risking your life every time we go underground. We deserve better pay. Um, 
Strikers were thrown out of their company-owned housing and replaced. Violence erupted and the militia was called up. What's interesting with the militia that was called up to Nanaimo to suppress this coal mine strike were uh, militias from Victoria, BC, the 88th Fusiliers and also the newly formed 50th Gordon Highlanders. And one of the key individuals sent up to Nanaimo was a fellow named Arthur Curry. And when you get to World War I, and we talk about Canada during the First World War, we'll talk quite a bit about this fellow named Arthur Curry. So remember that name, Arthur Curry. Uh, he's going to be important uh, in Canada's uh, effort in the Great War. So, so yeah, militia was called out and the strikes were disbanded, but 175 miners were arrested and 39 were sentenced to prison terms. But the mines were shut down in the 1930s. So the Dunsmuir mines never, never recovered from this horrible strike. Its reputation had plummeted. People were not happy. People, people were really beginning to realize that maybe, just maybe, people who worked in these kind of conditions were entitled to uh, greater respect and dignity. So, well. If you think the immigrants had a hard time from Eastern Europe, um, certainly the Chinese faced tremendous challenges in this country as well. Um, and the more Chinese and South Asians that came to Canada, unfortunately, the greater racism existed and occurred in this country as well. Many of the Chinese and Asians came to um, BC for work, particularly on the railroad. Um, and the Caribou Gold Rush and the building of the CPR brought many Chinese to BC for work. We have to remember that the Chinese were invited and encouraged to come by CPR agents who went to China, particularly Hong Kong and the coastal ports, Shanghai and others, to entice Chinese workers to say, hey, come to Canada, we're building a railway, we need workers. Um, um, you know, because they knew that the Chinese were going to work hard for low pay. I mean, unfortunately, that's what this was all about. Um, they worked hard for a little pay, and by 1891, 9,400 were working in BC. Chinatown sprang up in Vancouver, Nanaimo, and Victoria, and were bustling communities. Soon, white Canadian workers complained about the competition, and in 1907, the Asiatic Exclusion League was formed to halt immigration. All right. Now, here in Victoria, we have a very robust Chinatown. It's very interesting, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the 70s, to me, the corner grocer where I lived, we had a Chinese grocer named Lee and Sons. Every community in this town in the 70s um, had Chinese groceries. And uh, they were a legacy of this period. And also, um, very robust Chinatowns. When I was a kid, my father used to take us to um, uh, Chinatown and uh, we would go for dinner and I just loved going down there because I was fascinated with the language, I was fascinated with the food, with the, with the writing, everything. And uh, for me as a kid growing up, the corner grocer was a part of my cultural experience as a young boy. My mom used to write me notes and I'd go up and, and get groceries and, you know, and, and, and come home. And, uh, you know, Mr. Lee, who I knew very well because I saw him on a regular basis, scared the heck out of me because he was a pretty tough guy. You wouldn't mess with him. Um, but I respected him, right? And I was fascinated with him as well. I don't ever recall feeling any uh, sense of uh, I'm better than or anything like that. He was, he was just another Canadian who happened to look a little different and speak a little different. But to me, he was just part of my community. So even as a young man, uh, the Chinese were a very, very visible part of my community. But look at this. What, what, this is what, what is so frustrating. The reality was is that more Chinese were coming to Canada because they were willing to do the work that other workers were not willing to do. And when more and more came to Canada and begin, begin to take up all these difficult jobs, then people say, hey, wait a second here, they're taking Canadian jobs, you know. And this party is formed in, I believe it's in Vancouver, the Asiatic Exclusion League. I mean, just, Quite remarkable to think of having a political party based on the central idea that we need to exclude these people from our society. 
when Lieutenant Governor James Dunsby refused to sign a bill limiting Japanese immigration in 1907, an angry mob in Vancouver of 1,000 ransacked and destroyed many businesses in the Chinese and Japanese parts of the city. Okay, now if you look at this picture here, for example, some of you who have a understanding of conditions, say, in Germany in the 1930s, might immediately assume that this was taken during Kristallnacht. The Night of Broken Glass, November 1938, when, when uh, S.A. Brown shirts went into the streets of, of German towns and cities and destroyed Jewish businesses. You know, this kind of thing just destroyed businesses. You know, and here's a group of Chinese workers, of course, who worked on the railroad as well. You know, that work, railway work, was, was brutally tough especially when it got to the Rockies and you're dealing with navigating through mountain ranges and, and a lot of men, a lot of Chinese workers died falling off trestles, uh, blown, blown up by dynamite, died from exhaustion and so on and so forth. What happens in Vancouver is quite disturbing. And just think of it that many of these Chinese families, you know, had a shop downstairs and then they might live upstairs or they might live behind. Even the corner grocery where I lived in the, in the 70s, the family lived behind the grocery. That was their home and that was their business. You know, I've read so many accounts of families that were just sitting, having dinner or something, and all of a sudden they hear all this ruckus and they look out the window and they see all these people coming up the street and destroying stores as they work their way up. What an incredibly terrifying experience for these poor individuals who were just there trying to live their lives, right? And now they're being uh, violently attacked by a mob. Uh, this was a profound embarrassment to Canada as Britain was an ally of Japan and Laurier apologized to the Japanese government, but at the same time limited immigration of Japan, of Japanese to 400 per year. So what ends up happening is that there's such pressure on the Canadian government to limit or reduce or even stop and halt immigration from Asia that the, the Prime Minister really had no choice. And, uh, and, and, you know, eventually what we do where the Chinese are concerned, we begin to implement uh, mechanisms that, that discourage them from coming by implementing what's called a head tax, which means that if you want to come to Canada, you've got to pay 50 bucks just to get in the door. And I believe the head tax went from 50 eventually to $500, making it nearly impossible for anyone to come. So rather than just saying, we don't want you to come, we're not going to welcome you here, it's like, sure, come on in, but you got to pay 500 bucks to get through the door. So, pretty cynical. All right, well, not only Chinese Canadians faced brutal discrimination, but South Asians as well. The term South Asians is relatively new within the last 15, 20 years, um, meaning, in this case, people from, from India. And when I was a kid growing up, we referred to people from India as East Indians, but of course, um, that has changed now. South Asians is the term that we use. Asian immigrants from India and China had been enticed by CPR agents in Hong Kong to come to Canada because they worked hard for little cost. A Royal Commission investigating the Vancouver riots had uncovered this. You know, that the reality was that many workers from Asia were willing to do the work that uh, Canadian white Canadians were not willing to do. So you shouldn't be giving them a hard time once they're willing to do that work. <clears throat> it was difficult to restrict South Asians from India because they were British subjects, right? Because uh, India was part of the British Empire and could not be denied entry into Canada. In 1906 amendment to the Immigration Act intended to prevent immigration by enacting a continuous passage law. A law stating that immigrants can only come from their home country via a non-stop direct route. Okay, so if you are going to come from China, you have to come directly from Shanghai to Vancouver in one trip. Well, we know that in many cases they might stop in Hawaii for refueling or getting supplies. And if that happens, they have not come by continuous passage. This is another thing just like the head tax. Instead of saying we don't want you here, 
which is really what this meant, we're going to make it impossible, we're going to put in laws that make it impossible for you to, to pass those expectations by a continuous passage. In 1914, a Sikh businessman named Gurdit Singh chartered a steamer called the Komagata Maru to transport 354 Sikh immigrants to Canada, leaving Hong Kong on April 4th, 1914, and making stops in China and Japan. That's his fatal mistake. But he was testing this law. Are they really going to stick to this continuous passage before heading to Canada <clears throat> and landing on May 23rd in Vancouver, 1914? The boat, when it arrived in Vancouver Harbor, it was when it reached the harbor, they were stopped from getting off the boat. They said, no, 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 you were not allowed to get off the ship. You did not come by continuous passage. And after two months of, t these poor guys were on this boat for two months in Vancouver Harbor. Um, after two months of tension and attempts by 200 officers to board the vessel, the ship was sent out of Canada by escort the Rainbow, right, the very ship that was loaned to us by Great Britain on July 23rd, 1914. So after this long journey to Canada, after two months of hostile quarantine in Vancouver Harbor, they then sent back to India. And of course later um, the Canadian government would apologize for this because Canada of course has a very dynamic and robust South Asian population as we do of course a very strong and robust Chinese population. You know Canada, much like the United States, is an incredibly diverse country and, uh, and really in many ways that's what makes us a, a great country is that diversity. So, Alright, well Women, of course, uh, the battle for getting the vote really begins to develop in Great Britain and of course uh, it trickles into Canada, you know, and by 1900 only male property owners had the right to vote. Women had very hard lives and housework was exhausting with large families and because women rarely worked outside the home after marriage, opportunities were limited. Now let's stop for a second. I want, to, want you to think about something here. Housework, for example, you know. If you guys want to clean your carpet now, what do you do? You pull the hoover or the dirt devil out of the closet and off you go. Did they have vacuums in 1900? No, they didn't. Do you know how they cleaned the carpets in those days? They dragged them out onto the deck hung them from a wire, hung them over the railing of the deck, and beat them with a stick until the dust and dirt fell off it. And, and then you drag the carpet back in and put it back down. That's how you clean the carpet. Now what about washing your clothes? Young people, I know it's difficult. you got to throw your stuff in a basket and maybe even throw it in the washing machine. Turn the darn thing on, throw the stuff in the dryer. If you're lucky, your parents fold your laundry, but maybe some of you fold your own laundry, which is kind of a nice thing to do when it's warm. It's out of the laundry. You put down it, it smells great, you fold it, pray. How do you think they washed laundry in those days? Did they have a washing machine and a dryer? No, they didn't. Uh, they would have to, you know, wrench, you know, they had these washing boards. You just scrub things over and over and over, and then, you know, you'd you'd wear away your fingers in the process and then you'd hang dry these things, right? And of course you'd iron things, you know, by heating it up and so forth. So washing and drying, things like that. I mean, we are so lucky today because we have all these conveniences that make housework a lot easier, but in those days uh, it can't be understated that just maintaining a home was incredibly difficult work. Women were also barred from many professions, including law, and were not eligible for scholarships. Interesting. Suffragists were mainly middle-class women who blamed many social ills, including poverty and child neglect, on alcoholism. Women could humanize politics and have a greater influence if they could vote. Now, I must say that... You know, alcoholism has been a problem in Western, in, 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 in societies for thousands of years. What women were arguing, and you know, when you look at the United States, and you look at uh, the organization called the Women's Temperance Movement, 
which becomes kind of a really strong lobby group that actually uh, gets a prohibition laws passed in the United States after World War I, the banning of alcohol in that country for a while. Uh, because there was enough proof to suggest that alcoholism was destroying families. It made men abusive, it made men miss work, men got fired. Um, that a lot of the social ills and problems that societies had revolved around the fact that there were things going on that people didn't talk about, you know. It was very uncomfortable for people to talk about alcoholism or child abuse or sexual abuse and all those kind of things, even though those things were rampant. It, nobody talked about it. And so, so the suffragists were saying, we have to have a say. We have to be able to vote. Uh, we have to be part of this society in order to make constructive changes in the future. So. Prairie men had greater respect for women because of the central role they played in homesteading and property building. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba were the first to get the votes in 1916. BC, a year later in 1970, look at Quebec, it took until 1940 to get the vote. You notice that this is happening during the war, and there's a reason for that. Largely because when all those young men left for Europe during World War I, women had to fill those positions left by men, whether it be farming or fishing or metalwork, whatever it may be, that in order to keep the economy going, women had to take up those jobs and uh, they kept this economy going as our young boys fought in the trenches of uh, Flanders and France during the Great War. So. All right, and that being said, that's where we're going to stop. And uh, the next two lectures are going to deal with, um, if you want to see them in order, although they're not going to be on my website in order, as I said previously, uh, they will be dealing with Canada in the First World War. And, uh, and then from there, we'll move into the 20s and 30s, and then, of course, into the Second World War. So lots of good stuff to come up. And uh, once again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care.